This is the 150th anniversary celebration interview with Robert Silby. And um, let me start by saying, um, where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, grew up in Brooklyn, uh, a lower middle class family, uh, Jewish family, uh, and uh, went uh, to the public schools in Brooklyn, which were, and this is in the 40s and 50s, they were good schools. Can you tell me a little bit about your family? Sure. Uh, I had a, a, an older brother who was a professor of history at Cornell, now retired, and uh, the, we were the only two kids. My mother and father uh, were uh, New Yorkers, both of them born in New York. Uh, uh, their uh, parents were born in Europe, in Eastern Europe, and had come over uh, in the early 1900s or maybe a little earlier. Uh, and settled in New York, and we lived in, uh, you know, a two-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn. Uh, my father was the only person in his immediate family who had gotten to go to college for a few years. He uh, studied chemistry in college uh, in Cooper Union, uh, but didn't finish. And when uh, he was the youngest of the five children. My mother was one, uh, one of 11 children, so I had an infinite number of aunts, uncles, and cousins, all of whom lived in the uh, Brooklyn, Queens area. And that's the way we grew up, my brother and I. Um, were there any particular influences during your childhood that you think sent you on a science path? Well, the fact that my father had studied chemistry was known to me, and he uh, he was a very, uh, what shall I say, uh, not an intellectual man, but he was a man who was interested in, in science and in understanding things, and he uh, he would talk to me about, about it. And, uh, of course, I had a chemistry set uh, when I was a kid, uh, set fire to the table a couple of times, and, uh, and he, you know, took an interest. So that was that's a, essentially the entire thing, you know. He didn't uh, he he really didn't know any chemistry anymore, but it, it was okay. Um, was, was there any moment where you really knew that you were destined to go into science? Actually, I had uh, decided in high school that I wanted to be an engineer, and uh, and uh, therefore. Uh, when I applied to college, I applied to uh, City College in New York, and uh, which is the only place where you have an engineering program in the City University. Uh, I also applied to MIT and Carnegie Mellon and a few other places and got into every place, but we couldn't afford for it to send me anywhere, uh, so I went to the City, city College in, on 137th Street in Manhattan for a year studying chemical engineering. And it was in that year, studying chemical engineering as it was taught then in the 50s, late 50s, that I decided that this was not for me. And I decided to study chemistry and switched to Brooklyn College to finish my degree in chemistry there. And why Brooklyn College? It was close to home. My brother had gone there. It was a very good uh, you know, part of the city university system. It was one of the top ranked places in the city university system. Uh, mostly convenience because it was uh, on a bus ride from my house. Um, was there any particular th characteristic or aspect of chemistry that drew you in? Yes, of course, uh, as soon as I started studying chemistry, I got interested in the area of chemistry that's closest to physics, what we call physical chemistry, and I uh, started to realize that that's really what I wanted to understand and to study and think about, and uh, uh, I, I, I would say that was a very slow development in my uh, mental apparatus, and uh, it didn't happen instantaneously. And uh, I should point out that the City University, and Brooklyn College in particular, had a very large number of required subjects in all areas. So I had to take philosophy, history, economics, sociology, uh, English literature, classics, and so on, before you could begin studying uh, uh, chemistry. Uh, uh, in, in, and, and so the last year is really where 
uh, you studied a lot of chemistry and physics, and that's when things really got settled in my mind. Sounds like a great education. It is a great education. Yeah, it is. It was. Um, were there any um, mentors at Brooklyn College? Yes. There was a, uh, a professor of physical chemistry there named Albert Levine, who uh, was a serious ch uh, chemist. And he taught me and two other uh, seniors uh, what we call quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics out of textbooks that are still useful textbooks. And uh, we had a seminar uh, on this, and he was the guy who really helped me understand what I wanted to do. Uh, he, uh, he also got me a summer job at uh, General Telephone and Electric, GT&E, uh, doing lab work, uh, working on semiconductors and so on. And, uh, and you know, actually knew some real chemistry and uh, so it got us excited about it. So how did you wind up at the University of Chicago for grad school? Well, it was, uh, that's another simple story. Uh, my, uh, I, I talked to Albert Levine, this Professor Levine, and we asked uh, uh, where sh uh, my friend uh, who and I, who were the you know the top students in the class at the time, uh, we asked where should we go? Where, you know, where should we apply? So uh, he gave us a list of all the you know the top schools. Uh, uh, I applied to Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, uh, uh, Chicago, and so on. Now, at Chicago, uh, it was a it was it was a time when you didn't go visit these places and like you do now. Uh, but uh, there was a man there who was very uh, young and very successful in this area of physical chemistry, and he had gone to Brooklyn College. So he uh, lured us. Uh, me and my friend both to uh, the University of Chicago, uh, and and Professor Levine, my my mentor, thought this was this was great. This was a, a terrific thing to do. So we went. I went to the University of Chicago, which also doesn't have an engineering school and is uh, you know fiercely intellectual about everything. And so we, my I, I didn't get married till. Um, after my first year at Chicago, but uh, uh, my wife also, my wife-to-be also applied to Chicago to come the next year in political science. And so uh, we spent four years there, and uh, I, it was great. It was a great place to, to uh, get a graduate education. And one of the world's most beautiful campuses. It's a great campus, and, uh, and uh, the Hutchins tradition of uh, liberal education fit very much into the way we, my wife and I, uh, thought that education should be. You know, uh, and and we really uh, felt uh, very much at home at, at the University of Chicago. And um, then it was time for your postdoc work. Yeah. So when I finished my uh, PhD, which. Uh, uh, was pretty good. I had uh, while I was at Chicago, there was another man, an Israeli, who uh, came to work with this man, Stuart Rice, who I worked with for my PhD. And this uh, Israeli is named Joshua Jortner. He's a very high-level physical chemist as well, and he spent a few years at the University of Chicago, coterminous with my staying there. And I worked with him as well as with Stuart Rice. And uh, and so th th we were very successful in what we were doing, and and so uh, when I applied for postdocs, um, I had to make a decision about whether to stay more or less in the same field or go into a different field and a slightly different field. I didn't really change very very much, and I decided that it would be good for me to try something new. And so instead of going to Caltech, where I had an offer from, uh, from uh, somebody that I knew, I went to the University of Wisconsin to work with an uh, older physical chemist, a man named Joe Hirschfelder, who had, uh, uh, was very well known at that time and had uh, been uh, one of the few uh, theoretical chemists or physical chemists to work on at Los Alamos during the great 
uh, wartime, and he had a million stories. He was a very interesting guy, and so I had a one year there. But then I decided after doing things with him that I'll now go and do something else, and so applied for jobs. It was a great time to apply for jobs. This is 1965. Uh, I had. I must have had 10 interviews and lots, you know, I didn't have 10 offers, but I had a lot of offers and one of them was MIT. Uh, well, I came here for an interview. I met a group of phys chemists here, physical chemists here, and uh, it was the place that I thought I would fit in best. And so uh, I accepted their offer and arrived July 1st, 1966 at, at MIT. Well, it, do you remember what it was about MIT that made you feel like this was the place that you would fit in best? Well, it was obviously the the colleagues in the department. Uh, they were the, and I was correct about that. I mean, I met people like Erwin Oppenheim, who's still, uh, you know, he's in his 80s now, but he's still coming in every day. I still see him every day, and Jim Kinsey and uh, Carl Garland and. Uh, uh, later on, uh, other people uh, arrived. There was a great bunch of colleagues, uh, a man named Isidore Amder, who unfortunately died soon afterward. Uh, th they made me feel right at home. Intellectually, they asked the right questions. They pushed me in the right way. Uh, we got on immediately. We started talking to one another and so on, which, is, uh, which was unusual at other places. There was a little bit of standoffishness. I, I, I had an offer from Harvard, and I just thought I couldn't go there. You know, it just it was completely different. You know, the MIT colleagues were just completely different and very welcoming. Do you remember when you got here? So you'd spent some time in a number of different academic institutions. Mm -hmm. What well, What was your first impressions? of MIT? Well, I think my first impressions of MIT were everybody's first impressions of MIT at that time. The buildings are old. The, the uh, paint in the corridors is something they must have gotten from the Navy. I mean, it's, it, it's why aren't they making this a nicer place to be, you know? I mean, the physical plant was deteriorating and it was it was already old uh, you know even 40 years ago and uh, and the and then the buildings all had numbers they didn't have names well they did have names but nobody used those names and the and the departments had numbers everything had numbers it just seemed a little odd to me uh, when I arrived maybe a lot odd that this is the way it was it just seemed uh, different you know I've, I've obviously, after 44 years, I've uh, figured it all out. But uh, at the time, I thought this, this is kind of strange, different. Um, when you first got here, since you you came anyway, yeah. despite <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, despite yourself. the numbers, yeah. Um, how was there anything different or distinctive about the culture, the student body, the? Well, again, I would point to the, my colleagues who, you know, I came in July 66. I had to start teaching almost immediately. I know this was all organized. My colleagues immediately came to me and said, uh, if you're going to teach this subject, I have lecture notes that I've taught it a couple of times. Uh, let me uh, bring down my lecture notes. You can look at w what I've done. They were so supportive of everything that that I wanted to do, and you know, basically, I wanted to do research and teach, and I wasn't thinking about anything else but those two things. Uh, and we, my wife and I, were enjoying Cambridge, and we were living in Cambridge, and uh, uh, we thought uh, they were great. You know, they invited us to their houses. They, you know, we had dinner with them. There was an immediate embrace. Uh, a, a, my immediate colleagues in the chemistry department, and it wasn't just the physical chemist; it was the entire department, uh, being, you know, coming out and saying, "We're glad you're here, and and we welcome you, and we're going to help you," and they did, and so this uh, mitigated completely the numbers and the paint and the, and so on because it 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 was the right choice for us. You know, we immediately connected with uh, a bunch of really nice people. 
Did your wife join the faculty at the same time? No, my wife uh, hadn't finished her PhD yet, and uh, she uh, spent time, uh, uh, so I arrived in 66, uh, she started working, uh, she was getting a PhD from the University of Chicago, but her mentor was 900 miles away, so she f very luckily found a mentor at Brandeis University who helped her with her PhD thesis, and she got her finally got her PhD thesis uh, and uh, and her PhD degree, and and uh, uh, very soon after got a job at Wellesley College, and she taught at Wellesley College for twenty years before coming to MIT. Um, going back to that welcoming spirit, mm -hmm. has that has that sort of characteristic of collaboration been important over the years in your work? Yes, yes. And uh, uh, I, my, my uh, group has widened and, and maybe also, you know, lengthened in various ways. And, uh, and collaboration with my colleagues here at, 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 in my department, but also in other departments, have been crucial for my, my own research and my teaching. And has you know in the best of places like MIT and and I don't I don't know other places very well but in the best of places this always happens the the sum is much larger than the uh, than the parts and uh, it is uh, it is tremendously important to keep that collaboration going and to that welcoming spirit it's in, in, in enormously important as Emma, MIT remember was a smaller place when I arrived 44 years ago with a smaller undergraduate body a smaller graduate student body a smaller faculty and it was it was a different place in a lot of ways and, it, and it's changed and and I think this collaborative spirit and this connections that are there are still there uh, although as I've gotten older I've taken different roles in the in, in in the playing out of, of that. Are there any examples that you have of, of a time when collaboration made a big difference in your work? A, in collaboration at MIT with yes. people at MIT? Yes. Uh, well, there was a, 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 a man in our department named Jim Kinsey. He, uh, he became department head sometime in the 70s, and uh, he was a very close friend of mine. And uh, I would say that uh, although we, we published a number of papers together, it was the daily interaction with Jim, who has a very sharp mind and, uh, and a very critical stance on things, that really changed the way I did science and made me think in different ways. And uh, he, he finally left to become dean of science at Rice University in the late 80s. It was a big loss for us. Uh, but I still I'm friends with him, and when we get together, he still has that critical stance that uh, I remember so well, and that really made a difference. The other thing was that in so I arrived in '66. In in late '69, um, Jim Kinsey and I cooked up an, uh, an idea. We decided we wanted to hire John Deutsch from, away from Princeton University. And uh, you know, he was a guy in our field. We we knew him because he had graduated from MIT, so he, you know he had visited a number of times. And we just thought this was a guy we had to have in our department. And uh, so we were two young, untenured faculty members, but we decided we were going to push this. And we went to the department head, it was John Ross, who was another great m uh, man, really a, another mentor for me. Uh, and we uh, pushed it, and we we did it, and we uh, you know, and the department came through and said, yes, this is the guy we need to get, and we got and we hired John Deutsch away from Princeton, and he arrived, I think, January 1970, and sort of the rest is history, you know, and uh, and he became a, a mentor as well, you know. So Jim Kinsey, John Deutsch, and I were the the trio, uh, you know, doing science together and and having a lot of fun, but doing really good science. And my, I should mention my friend John Ross, who uh, 
was department head from 66 to 71 or something like that and stayed at MIT for another 15 years before going to Stanford. John, uh, he once pulled me aside and he said, let me give you a piece of advice. Be nice to the young guys on their way up so they'll be nice to you on your way down. Best piece of advice ever given. And he, uh, and uh, I lived by that. I don't imagine a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about your, um, your areas of research and expertise, um, mm. not being a chemist myself. Um, I, I just, I, I'm mostly interested in what it is about this area that interests you and why it's been a passion. Um, so physical chemistry? Physical chemistry, as I said before, is the, uh, is the connection or the interface between physics and chemistry. And so you apply physical laws like quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics to try to understand chemical problems, why reactions occur, why uh, molecules have the spectrum that they have, and so on. Uh, it is not something that you immediately say, well, oh, I have an application, I'm going to make a widget or, or, you know, or solve the world's problems, but it is trying to understand at a basic level what's going on in molecular interactions and, uh, and how that can be uh, used if you understand interactions between molecules, how that can be used to understand the properties of materials. That's the basic idea. And the passion is that this is supposed to be a theory that, a theoretical framework that is uh, foolproof. It's supposed to be, you know, if the only thing is it's very hard to make it work correctly. And so there are, uh, tricks, there are ways of working, there are creative things to do to, to think through how to make it work right for the system that you're looking at, which, which is the art of, of this. And, uh, and so quantum mechanics has become my passion. You know, I want to understand uh, how quantum mechanics works in all its uh, glory, and uh, it's a, it's it, le it has led to my current passion, which, to, which is to try to understand the initial steps of photosynthesis, where light is absorbed, energy is transferred, electrons and holes are separated, and, and chemical reactions begin, all in uh, uh, a picosecond, a very short time. And so, uh, this is all quantum mechanics, and it all has, a, you know, a very nice uh, story about it uh, that you can tell about photosynthesis and perhaps solar energy and so on. So, uh, it, it's been my passion. I, I, I'm just fascinated by by people who sort of who have an interest that sustains them for such a long period mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it morphs, and um, but it's very interesting to me. And um, so, I, I have um, the properties of polymers. Yes, I was I was interested uh, for a while. There was a, I should say, the the probably the uh, the sing essential thing that I've done in, in research has been to work closely with experimenters. So when a new experiment comes along and something unusual is seen, often my friends, the experimenters, will come to me and say, I've seen an unusual thing, what do you think? And, uh, and therefore I sit down and think about it together with the experimenter and we often come up with some, some answers. And about uh, 1980 or 1979, uh, some physicists at the University of Pennsylvania discovered that if they took a, a molecule that they called polyacetylene, which is a, a, a polyene, it's a molecule that a, a chemists know very much about, and they, uh, and they oxidize this molecule, they got very high conductivities. They saw very high conductivities. And there were some very puzzling properties about these 
this kind of activities. And they were physicists, and they started to use quantum mechanics to try to understand it. And uh, I was contacted by a friend uh, who had, uh, it was working at Allied Chemical now, and, and who I had worked with before. And he said, this, did you hear about this stuff? It's absolutely fascinating. You know, why don't you come down to Allied Chemicals? We'll spend the day. We'll talk about it. We'll think about it. We came down. I came down to uh, Allied. We spent the day talking about the experiments and how it could be explained and so on. And then suddenly we had a new project. And it was on these polymers that conducted uh, electricity. And so and it subsequently won a Nobel Prize for the Pennsylvania uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, scientists. But it became a very big uh, area of study. And we, were, we got in there very early because a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, do you understand this? I don't understand it. Let's talk. So, and that's happened subsequently in other areas uh, where I just go from one to another within the general area of quantum mechanics and materials. So it sounds like when you wake up in the morning, you don't know whether today is going to launch you on a whole new field of interest. Well, these days, I'm pretty sure it's not. But uh, <laughs> but you're right. There were many, many years when it was all, all dependent on um, what, the, what the mail or telephone had to do. Um, and then uh, single molecule spectroscopy? That's another example where a, 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 a scientist at IBM in, in California discovered a way of looking at the spectrum of a single molecule that is stationary on a, well, on a slide, let's say, and he could actually interrogate that molecule with light and measure the spectrum of the molecule. Now, if you measure the spectrum of the molecule, you measure the energy levels of the molecules, what the electrons are doing and what the vibrations are doing. Single one molecule, that is not, that was a tour de force experiment. And very quickly, other people started looking at it. And, and we said, I don't understand the, the, the experiment. So uh, uh, I contacted the experimenter. We talked about it. I you know, talked to my students and postdocs. And we sat down. And we started writing theoretical models for this kind of, uh, of uh, experiment and uh, we got very, it got very interesting for for about six or seven years and now this kind of single molecule spectroscopy is used in biology all the time in a different slightly different kind of way than originally but it is now a, a big deal and, and so we were there at the beginning that must be kind of fun hmm? it's always fun um, and then I, the uh, interactions in molecules and solids. Yeah, that's vibronic. Yeah, uh, that was in a collaboration with uh, with my colleague Bob Field in the uh, chemistry department, who's a who's an experiment. I'm a theorist. He's an experimenter, and he and I uh, uh, got together to think about. Um, what happens when you take a molecule, let's say with four atoms or four, five atoms, let's say four atoms, and you pump a lot of vibrational energy in? So, so what I mean, uh, we were looking at acetylene. Acetylene is a linear molecule, two carbons, two hydrogens. You pump a lot of vibrational energy in, the hydrogens are moving all around. Can you turn that acetylene into another molecule? So the hydrogen flips over onto the other side into another molecule, which is called vanillidine. And, and is very reactive. And, and so the people who do real chemi chemical reactions think it goes to this other species. And we were trying to do it, or Bob and the lab was trying to do it with light by just exciting the molecule with light, very, very highly excited. And we uh, were trying to understand it theoretically by modeling what would happen to a molecule when it, when it got up there. So it was another collaboration that lasted probably eight or nine years in, uh, here at MIT and was very fruitful. Um, and then this, this is my favorite, the highly vibrationally excited polyatomic molecules. Yeah, well, it's the same, 
same s stuff. S same thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the uh, relaxation and coherence in low temperature systems? Uh, so that's quantum mechanics. So uh, there's something about quantum mechanics that is um, uh, not very odd, but, but is a, a signal of quantum mechanical interactions. When, when molecules interact, the, uh, the excitation on one molecule and, and, and another molecule nearby feel each other, and they get coherently Intera interacting, they they work together in a in in a funny way, and recent experiments. This is within the last couple of years have shown in photosynthetic systems at very short times there seem to be this coherence, this quantum mechanical coherence showing up. And the question is, does this make a difference for the efficiency, the, the tremendous efficiency of uh, energy? light energy transfer to the reaction center of photosynthesis so that you can start the chemical reactions going. And it looks like in some systems there is that this quantum mechanical coherence is necessary to explain the efficiency of the process. And so we are in the midst of doing calculations now uh, of, of these experiments that were done uh, in, at Berkeley. In Chicago, and is this is this related to the um, molecules and glasses and solids? Well, no. The molecules and glasses were this, were, were uh, um, early attempts to understand the single molecule spectroscopy because that's the way people looked at them. They they took them and put them in in a glass and and lowered the temperature very much so that they could uh, they could keep them in the same place and do single molecule spectroscopy. So there's quantum mechanics there and we, you know, all of what we do is try to uh, apply this quantum mechanical ideas and see whether uh, they're operative in, in, the, uh, in the system. They're, of course they are always operative, but can you see the signal that, they, that they're operative? Can you, can you understand how it is? And what's the particular appeal of theoretical chemistry? Well, uh, I started out at, at the University of Chicago thinking I was going to be a, an experimenter. And I worked for nine months with a very strong experimental scientist named Clyde Hutchison. And I was doing experiments which required uh, uh, Doing uh, uh, low temper at low temperatures. Uh, at that time, it was liquid nitrogen, 77 degrees Kelvin. And I realized in that ye nine months that uh, if after the number of accidents that I had and the number of broken things that I had, that I didn't have the temperament for experimental science. For, for experimental science, uh, you have to be a patient person. You have to not grab. You have to think before you, you, you do everything. And I was young. I didn't have that temperament. And so uh, I did have the temperament to spend long hours slogging over equations. And so it was clear to me that theory was my strong point. That was an important thing to learn in school. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, from the research you've done, are there any applications um, that have come out of it that have been particularly interesting to you or that you're particularly proud of? Well, I've never, uh, unlike most of my MIT colleagues, I've never uh, been uh, someone who's been oriented toward applications. I've, obviously, if something happens, that's wonderful, but I've never pursued it very much. These organic... Uh, these conducting organic polymers that I told you about from 1979, 1980 have, are in use now. Uh, the, I mean, in, ola, in organic light emitting dia, diodes, and even television screen that Sony has uh, uses these, these organic uh, molecules. So some aspects of the kinds of work we did are very early on uh, have led down the long road to, to these applications. 
Uh, and you know, my hope is by understanding the early stages, early steps of photosynthesis, uh, that we will be able to make design criteria for uh, synthetic uh, photosyn photosynthetic arrays, for for man-made arrays, and so on. But that you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to try to understand and understand how you can make the efficiencies high and so on. So your interest is really in figuring out how it works. Correct. And then moving on to the next thing to figure out how it works. Correct. OK. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about teaching. Yeah. Um, how would you describe the experience of teaching at MIT? Well, first of all, I, I've always been interested in teaching. And I knew when I came to MIT I wanted to teach, and I wanted to teach well. Uh, my, uh, my first year teaching at MIT, I was 26 years old. The, the students in my class were, I was teaching a freshman class, so they were 17, 18 years old. And there was a young man in my class uh, who uh, I was teaching freshman chemistry you know, to a group of 25 students or something like that. And there was a young man in my class who came up after class and said, ask me a question about quantum mechanics. And I realized that this was an interesting group of students. This kid knew what he was talking about. And we became a little friendly. And he, you know, he was well beyond the chemistry that uh, I was teaching the other students. And, uh, and he kept, you know, asking his questions all term. And I realized that, uh, you know, Teaching at MIT was going to be a very interesting uh, uh, sport because there were just incredible students. I mean, the average student is very high, but there are these four sigma or six sigma students who are just unbelievable. You know, so and you know, much smarter than I am. And, uh, so that was uh, interesting. So you have to be on your toes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I always tell the story of teaching thermodynamics one year to 250 kids in the class in 10 to 50. And uh, it's the middle of the term, and a student raises his hand in the lecture. It's unusual. And he says, How? and he asked me a question. I won't bother you with the question. He asked me a question. And I said, well, it's easy, you know. Write down the equations. I wrote down the equations, and I couldn't solve them. And I said, OK, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get back to you the next lecture and, uh, and tell you the answer. I can't figure it out on the board right now. But I'll t to make it interesting, I will give 25 extra points on the total score of the course for anybody who comes up with the answer before I get back. And I went back to my office, and I worked, and I worked on this, and I could not solve the problem. So I. I finally said, I've got to go talk to one of my mentors. So I went to talk to Professor Oppenheim, who's a great thermodynamics expert. And I talked to him and gave him the problem. He looked at me and he said, mm, I'll have to get back to you on that. And I knew I was in trouble. And so I went back to my office and I worked again. And you know, the, for the next day, I still didn't solve the problem. On the way to the lecture, that I was going to have to admit I still didn't solve the problem, I ran into an emeritus professor in the chemistry department named Clark Stevenson, who had taught thermodynamics for years. And I said, Clark, you've got to help me. I asked him the question. Instantaneously, he gave me the answer, and I understood. I went to the class very proud that I had the answer. And that kid who had asked me the questions had the answer, too. He same answer. Same answer. So. You've got to be careful about what you say to the students. You cannot snow them. You can't say, well, gobbledygook, and they just don't buy it. You know? So you've got to be honest, and you've got to admit when you don't know, and you've got to work hard figuring out how to explain things. And do you know where that kid is today? No, I don't, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so y you've been a real advocate of excellence in teaching. I'm, I'm kind of wondering why that's been such a focus for you, why you think it's been so important to you. Well, I, as I said, I, 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 
I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I enjoy teaching very much. This, uh, I mean, I, I should say that uh, lecturing, uh, which has gone out of style now, but still is there is a, a good lecturer can uh, provide a tremendous amount of information that gets into the heads of students. Uh, uh, whether it stays there is not is always a question. Um, and I've tried to be, uh, you know, an, a good, a good lecturer. And, and the other aspect of why I'm interested in, in teaching, especially at MIT, is uh, my education, which was completely different from an MIT education, which was, as I told you, filled with humanities, arts, and social sciences in a prescribed way, where we all did more or less the same stuff, or always a few electives. And w in which I learned so much and, and thought was so important to my life that I thought MIT should move in that direction. And so I became an advocate for uh, changing the general institute requirements, for getting things, uh, for, for decreasing the size of the departmental programs and allowing the students to have more latitude and take uh, electives and things like that early on when I came to MIT. In fact, uh, when I came to, I, I, I told you I came in 66. By, by 68, we were living in a dormitory as, as assistant house masters in senior house, 68 to 70. It was an interesting time to be in the, uh, living in a dormitory. Uh, and uh, we moved out only when our first child was born uh, in 1970. In addition, about 1969, there was a group of faculty uh, who were th putting together Concourse, the first or maybe the second special freshman year program, and they wanted a chemist. So we were going to do physics, math, chemistry, humanities, arts, and social science of the first year at MIT in a unified way. So we were going to do study the 17th century. We'd study Newton, we'd study Galileo, we'd study, we'd read Brecht's Galileo, we'd, we'd do uh, everything and tr try to dovetail it into thinking about this, the, the, the beginning of the Enlightenment, the beginning of the 17th century. And I thought this was great, so I joined them. And I, we were in the first, uh, you know, the, I was in concourse for two or three years. And you, you burn out pretty quickly there in, in something like that because it was constant. There were, we had 25 s freshman students. I have no idea why MIT allowed us to do what we did, but it was an experiment. I think it was an experimental time at MIT, so they let us do this, and we got 25 students. Concourse is still going. It's, it's changed off, off and on over the years. And uh, and we had a great time. We, I mean, this, the faculty learned more than the students did. I can tell you that we had a great time. I, I was doing my also chemistry department teaching as well. This was just an add-on that I just decided I'll do it and I'll enjoy it. I would love to take that course. It was a great course. It was a great course. The, uh, unfortunately, it was. Uh, all of the faculty in it, only one person had tenure, and most of them did not get tenure. Uh, so they were, uh, Larry Bucciarelli got tenure, he's an aero astro guy, uh, and I got tenure. And the rest of the people in the group, Duncan Foley in economics, and uh, Dave Oliver in aero astro, and uh, Nancy Dworsky in literature, and a few other people, you know, they, for whatever reason, they, they didn't get tenure. And it was too bad. We lost a lot of good teachers. You don't think it had anything to do with their participation in this experiment? Well, they might have spent too much time, you know, doing that and neglecting, you know, the research that one has to do. I don't really know. I'm, uh, I'm, in my case, it worked out fine. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Technology Enhanced Active Learning Program? Uh, yeah, I've, I was involved in that only as a dean. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this arises, the, or this ar arose, from the, the uh, physics department 
worrying about how much students actually retained from lectures and, and doing 801 and 802, which are the first two uh, physics classes. And people like John Belcher and Dave Pritchard and, uh, and others, I, I don't know the whole cast of characters, were really concerned that um, students were not getting it, were not understanding uh, the way you do physics, but you think through physics problems. They could do the problems up to a point reasonably well, but they were not really understanding what was going on. That's what was worrying them. And if you, if you had gone to a physics lecture in, uh, usually they were in 26100, this is the biggest classroom on campus, you have 600 students or 500 students in the room, it's almost impossible to have control of that situation. Walter Lewin, who is, you know, a, a lecturer par excellence, a, a man who's, you know, half an entertainer in the, because he gets the students to, to listen and to think by doing that, uh, but he's a unique. It's very hard to do. So, I mean, and, and so you have to figure out a way to, rep, to replicate the uh, getting this information into the students' heads and having it stay there so that you don't get the next year a problem that they say, I don't know that, you know? And, and, you, and you can prove to them you taught them that, but they don't, they really don't know it, you know? And so you have to think through how to do it. And so uh, the idea was to have the, you know, nine students sitting around with their laptops and a mentor going around talking to them and, and, and trying to see whether this techno TEAL, Technology Enhanced Active Learning, was going to uh, solve the problem, at least partially, you know, at least get more students uh, uh, to, to understand how, how to do the, the problems and how to think through a physics problem. Uh, the funny part was the really good physics students hated it. Why? <laughs> because they wanted the macho stuff, you know. They wanted it differently, and they thought this was watering it down. But I think largely the students uh, who are taking it now find it uh, a, a good way to do to do. Uh, uh, to learn now, the question is: Can you know? Do we should we do this in in the other large classes? Uh, we haven't gone that way yet. We haven't figured it out. It's a capital intensive money, you know, to build all these things and so on. And and the physics faculty, Dave Pritchard and John Belcher, are spending a lot of time assessing how well they're doing. And I think we will know pretty soon how you know the you know, the real effects of doing it this way. It's a great idea. Did it take the place of the large lecture, or was it just sort of like a... Well, of course, it started in as, a, as an experiment, but now it's taken the place of the large lecture. Yeah. So it started as an experiment, uh, uh, side by side, and grew until I think now, in both 801 and 802, they're, they're doing teal. Um, I wanted to get into some of the ways that you've um, contributed to the MIT community. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we uh, start with the um, the task force that looked at tenure? Oh, that. Uh, let's not start with with, okay. with that. Okay. That, start uh, where you want. Okay. So um, I think you know if I were to say what am I proud of uh, what I've done at MIT, uh, you know. I, I've been department head in chemistry. I've been director of the Center of Material Science and Engineering. I've been dean of science. But I think most proud of being the co-chair uh, of the uh, first task force on student life and learning and the next task force on the undergraduate commons. Uh, they had very different outcomes, uh, which is uh, I'm, it's too bad. but. Uh, uh, I think we learned a lot, and we and we pushed uh, uh, 
the envelope a lot at MIT. So the, the task force for student life and learning was in the mid-90s. And what happened was I had stepped down as department head after five years, very happily to go back to research and teaching. Uh, and uh, Chuck Vest called me up. And uh, he got me, uh, he found me in Switzerland where I was at a scientific conference. And uh, we talked and he said he wanted me to co-chair this task force on student life and learning. And he said to me, basically, we're in a situation now, it's the mid-90s, a lot of talk about delivering lectures over the web, over the internet. Uh, you know, what is MIT going to look like in 2025? What, what, what will we be? What do we have to do to, to retain our, our quality and our position? And, and he was talking about education, undergraduate education. So we had a task force with a bunch of great people. And John Hansman was the co-chair. And we met for two years uh, and thought about a lot of different things. And we made a lot of, uh, we wrote a report, which I think was a pretty good report, about, uh, about thinking through uh, what MIT should do in order to position itself and with respect to internet you know, and all this. And you know the bottom line. There were lots of suggestions, but the bottom line was we said what makes MIT great as an educational institution is what happens when the students and the faculty work together, and when the students and the students work together. That's what makes MIT work. That's what makes MIT a great university. You can't have everybody sitting in their homes not actually interacting with each other and expect to have a great university. Therefore, if you want to have a great university in 2025, you're going to have to have a campus here. And this campus has got to be something that students and faculty are going to want to be at. And they're going to want to work together as they have always worked together in the past. And so the most important thing to do is to say, we're going to have a campus that's going to be great, that people will want to be at, and will therefore have the necessary structure to allow for this great collaboration that goes on. And you know they they agreed. Chuck and the and the corporation agreed. And we have new dormitories. We have a new uh, athletic facility. The campus has been uh, changed. We talk more about interactions between students and and other students and students and faculty. We think differently. I think after that that report, and I think we made a difference at MIT. Did the, did the big building thing ha come out of that task force report? Well, we didn't say build a lot of buildings, but we said if you want students to come here, you've got to have dormitories that are you know, interesting places, good places to live in interesting places. It's got to be, you know, and, and so there was, Simmons Hall came, came out of that, I think. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the research buildings weren't part of this uh, idea, but the idea that and I think also the re the, the new uh, the Zeziger building, uh, the the new gym, and the new swimming pool came came out of that. I mean, the idea that this is a community where faculty and students get together, and this has to be a complete community, so that more faculty can live nearby, more faculty can live on campus with the students. This is a great idea. This will make MIT, or continue uh, to have MIT be a great university. That was the import of that. Of that. And it sounds like the th that thinking has, has permeated all the way through, because I've, I've been hearing a lot of that from the interviews that I've been doing yeah. about the importance of the um, student-teacher collaboration and yeah. 
we didn't invent this idea. You know, we, we uh, believe me, we're not that creative. We, we listened you know, on the task force. We listened to everybody uh, that, we could he that was willing to talk to us. It's the way you do it. And you, and you listen until you say, ah, this is what people want. This is what they see as the, 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 the quality of MIT arising from. Let's, so let's write it down so that we don't forget it. You know? and, and I think that's what we did. Um, other contributions mm -hmm. to the MIT community. That was... That was the Task Force for Student Life and Learning. Now, the Task Force for the Undergraduate Commons, this was, again, Chuck Vest called me up, wrestled me to the ground. I was dean of science at the time. He said, you're the only person that can do this. We have to look at the uh, general institute requirements, the, 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 the undergraduate program. I didn't really want to do it because it was, uh, it's a, uh, trap, you know, filled with people who, are, who have uh, interests that they, they're afraid to, to lose. But we went through it and we made, we had a great committee again, uh, and we made a lot of suggestions for what I, what I said before of uh, opening up the, inst the institute requirements. I mean, the idea I mean, this is a triviality, but the idea that an MIT student can graduate from MIT without ever having taken a statistics or a probability course, or a quantum mechanics course, or a course on Shakespeare is, you know, it makes me, my blood boil. Why aren't we, uh, you know, why are these, the systems so tightly wound that we can't allow students to search around a little bit more, to think, you know, to think through it. Why do we have to have these absolute set of uh, institute requirements? So we, we had two levels of institute requirements in our report. One that was absolute for everybody, a year of physics, a you know, term of chemistry, and you know, some year of math. But then you could have some other uh, uh, choices in the matter. The you know, there were a lot of, uh, we almost won, but the, but the, the fact, and of course the humanities, arts, and social science, we wanted to change dramatically. I think that will change somewhat. Uh, but the science requirements, um, you know, you come up against a lot of uh, interests that don't want change because it means ch changing your uh, undergraduate requirements, uh, changing your undergraduate program in chemical engineering or or mechanical engineering or chemistry or something and so um, we lost by a few votes and it was a big disappointment and I spent two years doing it let's go back to the um, task force on undergraduate educational commons um, when you put together the tell me what happened when you put together the list of what everybody should know before they graduate. Right, so we, we put together a list, a uh, group of 25 of us put together a list, what should every graduating senior at MIT know? Uh, and of course it was a list that would take 10 years of courses to, to uh, master. And, uh, and we realized in four years you can't do this, but what can you do? Well, it goes back to the Greeks. Education is not filling a bucket. Education is lighting a fire. And that's the idea. The idea is you excite students about the learning on their own and learning by interacting with one another, and you, you're off and running. And MIT students are fantastic. You know, they can do it. So it's only a question of lighting the fire. And uh, there are great teachers in MIT who do some of that, but there's n there should be more of it. And there should be more ways of lighting the fire. And one important way is to make sure that students can take electives in a variety of things so that they can find out where, uh, where, where that fire will start. 
So in before we talk a little bit more about the administrative work you you've done mm -hmm. are there are there other um, committees um, do you want to talk about the task force on tenure or well uh, I would talk about uh, in the 80s I was uh, uh, on a number of committees again on education we I was on the committee that suggested that the biology requirement be instituted the change in the GIRs to in, to put biology in which uh, I think our committee thought was a no-brainer, but we ran into you know the usual uh, kind of thing where if you added an, an extra requirement, where was it going to come out of? It's not going to come out of my program, and uh, we had to compromise in some ways about that. But we got it done, and I worked with Margaret McVicker on on a variety of committees and trying to uh, move in the direction that I've always tried to move in, as I've told you uh, over and over again. And so, you know, I got to be known as a person who uh, was interested in education, had strong views, but was, you know, willing to work with people you know, and, and try to you know, be on committees and try to do things. And and we uh, we did that. Uh, I did that as as often as I could. I was also on. Uh, uh, see, MIT is a, a nice place that way. If you want to do that stuff, they let you do it. So I, when I was a, I think in 1971, I was put on the Committee on Educational Policy, which was the forerunner of the Committee on the Undergraduate Program. Uh, you know, I was an untenured faculty member, but somebody knew I was interested, and they put my name up and I got on that committee and I started meeting people from other departments who are interested in this and similar things and I learned the richness of MIT early on in in a variety of ways and that that's something that you know we doesn't happen to every junior faculty member because sometimes they're cloistered they they want to do their uh, their own research only and I was very lucky uh, about that. I was also uh, on the Committee on Undergraduate Admissions, which wrote a report saying we should have more women uh, students at MIT. Uh, that was uh, uh, something that uh, was clearly going to happen, and we wrote a report very early on in the, in the early 70s saying admit more women students. You know, you're crazy. There's 50 percent of the world, you know, we'll get good students. That also was fought by a lot of the fa uh, faculty at, at MIT, you know, saying that women can't handle the MIT uh, program. But that got done. And it, that got done because Paul Gray was right behind it. And he, he made it happen. That's another thing. I, I was, uh, this is a story. Uh, uh, in 1978 or 79, Paul Gray, who was chancellor at the time, got an invitation to come to China, or MIT got an invitation to come to China with a group to start interactions between MIT and Tsinghua University and, univers uh, and other universities in China. And Paul Gray, who is a great man, I'm sure you've interviewed him or somebody has, Paul Gray decided to take along a group of faculty who were teachers. And so he took me, he took uh, Art Maddock, uh, Fernand Corbato from Electrical Engineering, Suzanne Berger from Political Science, C.C. Uh, uh, Chen from civil, I think, and we went to China in 1979. It was a couple of years after the Gang of Four were uh, arrested, and, you know, and not so long after Mao died. And we went to China, you know, landing in, uh, Be in Beijing Airport, the biggest photograph, biggest picture of Mao Zedong you ever saw at the airport. It was fantastic, and we went to Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Hangzhou, uh, and then I went out uh, through Guangzhou and Hong Kong at the at the end. It was fantastic. I mean, I was, you know, a young guy. You know, I wasn't a 
big shot, you know. Uh, Paul just wanted teachers. He wanted to bring teachers, show them what we had. So when when you uh, around here, it seems like when you have um, strong opinions, but you can get along with other people, you wind up in administration. A lot. <laughs> yes. So, um, talk to me a little bit about um, first department head. Every administrative job I had it was an accident. When uh, uh, in 1990, uh, Mark Wrighton was asked by Chuck Vest, who had just become president, Mark Wrighton was asked to be uh, provost. Mark was department head in chemistry. So the dean of science at that time, who was uh, Gene Brown, asked me in. He said, would you take a temporary assignment as department head until we can find the real department head? I said, sure. And they, I spent, spent five years. Uh, and at the end of that five years, <clears throat> it, was, it was not a good time at MIT. It was a time of budget cuts and, uh, you know, and it's not as bad as it was in the last few years, but it was a time when w it's hard to do things. And uh, uh, so not much happened in the chemistry department at the time. We needed a new building, a renovation didn't happen. So I, would, I was disappointed at the end of that, and I didn't think I wanted to s stay in administration. So after uh, being department head for five years, I stepped down, and then uh, I continued my research. I was, at that time, uh, in the Center for Material Science and Engineering. I was uh, part of that center's research program. And the center director was Mark Kastner, and Mark was asked to be department head in physics. And so the uh, uh, vice president for research asked me whether I would be willing to be interim director of the Center of Material Science and Engineering. So I said, OK, I'll be interim director. And so I became director of the Center for Material Science and Engineering. And we uh, submitted a proposal and got the great scores and defended it at NSF. And we did. Great. So I was proud of that. And uh, a few years later, uh, 1990, in February, Bob Bergino was offered the presidency of the University of Toronto. He was dean of science. He uh, accepted. And uh, Bob Brown, the provost, called me up and said, would I take the temporarily the interim dean of science job. And I said, OK, I'll do it. So every time it was, you know, I was just somebody who could be fitted into the slot, and uh, everybody, nobody had to worry that I was going to do something crazy. And, uh, and I did my job. And being department head wasn't fun, I would say. Being director of the Center of Material Science was great. It was all research. I didn't have any personnel decisions to make. It was, you know, just we had lots of money, and I, had, I got to give it out. It's very, everybody's happy. Uh, there were no hard decisions uh, there. Dean of Science was, you know, crazy. You know, there's uh, the personalities in the School of Science, uh, just like every other school, are all over the place. It's the complete g distribution, and uh, you know you have to deal with all of them. And uh, uh, we got, but we, I worked for f for five years with Bob Brown and Chuck Fest, and then two and a half years with uh, with Raphael Reif and Susan Hockfield. And uh, Bob Brown and Chuck Vest, it was a good time financially. And they got the uh, ex corporation to agree to build. And we built the Stata Center. We built the Neuroscience Building. We, renov we built the phys new physics building. We renovated the chemistry department. I mean, it just went on and on. We did a lot of uh, uh, deferred maintenance. You know, and I, I got to, be, to wear a hard hat a lot and go around and look at, at buildings. And, it, it, the 
Cancer Center was the last building that I kept clamoring for that we had to have, and and happily we got the donations to to do it. So it was uh, that was fantastic, and we won four Nobel prizes in the School of Science while I was dean. I had nothing to do with it, but it was great. And my friend uh, Dick Schrock invited my wife and me to come to Stockholm with him. So we even went to the ceremony, and it was absolutely great. So it was, it was a lot of up, and there were a lot of downs, too. Were there things that you wanted to do as dean that you weren't able to do? Well, the, uh, the answer to that question is that I was not somebody who said, I have a list of things that I have to get done. I listened to the department heads and the faculty in the School of Science, and from what they told me, I learned what had to be done. And then I would have to prioritize. The, the one thing that I think we never really got done was the fact that the Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department, which is a great department, is in this very tall building, which is in bad building for research and we they really need new laboratories and they they were spread out and they had we never got that to a high enough priority to get them what they needed and I was desperate about that that but it just never came up never got got done so I got while I was dean I had you know we were winning Nobel prizes we had we hired great new young faculty. Uh, we hired a lot of senior faculty, too. It was, a, it was uh, the first five years were like a go-go years. I mean, we just did, uh, you know, Bob Brown uh, always was willing, you know, to talk about what you want to do something, let's talk about how it can be done. Not, he never you know, told you how it can't be done. He told you how it could be done if it could be done. But you know, we had a lot of crises as well, but he was always there, you know, uh, you know working with, he, with me on getting things done. And, you know, Raphael is a similar kind of guy, but the economic situation is desperate. It's completely different now, and, and unfortunately, and so. What is it that people don't know about being a dean, you know. Well, I'm, uh, if I uh, if I would guess, I would guess they don't know uh, how complicated their colleagues can make life. I mean, uh, when when you're a department head, you see your colleagues differently, you know. Uh, let me try to explain. When, when you're a, just a faculty member who's doing research and teaching, what you want as colleagues are great researchers. You want Nobel Prize winners. You want potential Nobel Prize winners. You think, hey, that's what you want, in the, at least in the School of Science. When you're a department head, you say, you know, I also need people who are going to be good citizens, who are going to do the scut work that has to be done, who's going to deal with the students, going to deal with the staff. The staff is great at MIT, but you know, they're not highly paid. They love it here for reasons that are like what the faculty love it. And uh, you know, being a department means you have to make a community, a little community that works, not just have people win Nobel Prizes even how great that is. When you're a dean, then you say, I've got to have departments that all work, and I've got to have citizens that are going to do interdepartmental things, and they're going to go to school things. And you look at your, your colleagues differently. You know, those people that you thought, and I'm, I'll be honest, those people you thought, well, you know, they're mediocre researchers on an MIT scale. You know, we could lose them, no problem. And then you find out that without them, 
the teaching schedule doesn't get made. The you know the the teaching doesn't get done, the, or you know, or some other important part of the function of the department doesn't get done, and you re, you start to appreciate people in a different way. And building a department and building a school requires a lot of different talents, and those a lot of those talents are invisible to most of our faculty. And so that's what you learn when you become an administrator, how to judge people in a broader, uh, broader context and appreciate people in a, in a broader context. It almost sounds like the higher you go in administration, the more important the people skills become of everybody. Of course, yeah. And, and, and the lack of people skills in uh, faculty and students and staff that, that are uh, there, you know, because there's a diverse group of people, can often cause problems that you can't believe. You know, you just, you know, when your name appears in the front page of the Boston Globe about something that one of your faculty members have done, you uh, know it's going to be a bad day. <laughs> Um, as, as part of my research, I, I read the, um, the report about increasing the number of women faculty mm -hmm. in the School of Science. Can you talk a little bit about why that's been um, such a challenge to do? Yeah, um, but there has been, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, work done. We, we started with the with the women's committee uh, that met, you know, the, the group of senior women in the School of Science that met in the uh, 90s, I think it was, uh, mid-90s, uh, and Bergino, as, as Dean of Science, put Jerry Friedman and me and Danny Kleitman, who were all former department heads, on the committee, he asked them to accept some men on the committee who, you know, would know how to deal with the MIT administration and, and uh, you know uh, so we were put on the committee we supported them you know very strongly uh, in terms of their uh, requests you know and we did and and you know we helped them to do the research that allowed them to you know get the uh, uh, things changed okay so then you know comes the point that you have to hire more women into the School of Science. Uh, we, uh, w we made lots of offers. We got lots of, uh, of women to think about it, and not everybody came, you know. Uh, we did, uh, uh, when I became dean, there were a, a group of uh, women that had been hired under Bob Bergino's last couple of years, a number of them left MIT. So while we were hiring, while I was dean, there were people, women leaving MIT, so our numbers didn't go up fast, very fast. It was very difficult to figure out how to make this happen. And, you know, it, you know, it's like the old New Yorker cartoon of these five gentlemen smoking cigars around the table, and one of them says, anybody here not a feminist? Everybody believes in this. On the other hand, making it happen is always tricky. My, as dean, what I finally, you know, I was twisting arms all the time, uh, and uh, you know, there were people who were telling me, just tell them you're not going to approve anybody unless they, they hire women. And, you know, and that works for the first woman, and then they go back to where they were. So I finally said, I, I have to get more women into positions of power. So I appointed uh, the first woman as the head of the Laboratory of Nuclear Science, June Matthews. Now, that's a, one of the largest grants and the largest laboratories at MIT. We have now a woman, and then she sat on Science Council. 
And then I appointed uh, Jackie Hewitt as head of the uh, the Cavalry, what's now the Cavalry Center, and and uh, and then I appointed Maria Zuber as head of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. And now Maria hired about five women, you know, as head of the department. And now uh, we have a uh, Sylvia Sayre is now head of the uh, Chemistry Department. So I hired, I, I appointed the first woman department head in the School of Science ever. And uh, I, I think it might have been the first woman department head in science or engineering ever. That made a difference. I think that was really more straightforward about getting things done than anything else that I, that I did, no matter how hard I, uh, I tried. And, uh, you know, when uh, the Science Council, which is the heads of the departments and the heads of the major labs, is half women, not quite there yet, but when it's like that, then it's going to be a different story. Yeah? When you made offers to faculty members who chose not to come, or when yeah. you had people on the faculty who chose to leave, what were the reasons that they gave? People never tell you uh, you're a terrible place and I can't, can't come there, you know. Whatever they think, they tell you you're a great place, but it's not the time of my life to move or it is the time of my life to move or, or you know, or, and, and so on. Uh, the, uh, so I'm not sure I, you ever get a really straight answer about what it is that's going on. You know, and uh, uh, you know, I tried to interview everybody, every everybody, men and women who left MIT, to try to figure out what was what was going on. I mean, some people don't get tenure. That's you know, fifty percent of people don't get tenure. Fifty percent of people do get tenure, approximately. Some people don't get tenure. They leave. You try to make sure they get a good job elsewhere. You do the best you can. Um, but when when a senior faculty member, a woman, moves to Harvard, it's not because she doesn't like the Boston area. Uh, there's something else going on, right? And that happened uh, and early on when I was when I was dean. It was a, a hire that Bergino made from Cornell to MIT as a senior. A couple of years later, she went to Harvard. My guess is. She wanted to go to Harvard all along, and she didn't get the offer until she got to the Boston area and was able to make the contacts or something. I don't know. Anyway, in any case, it happened. Do you feel like there's, um, with the addition of women in more administrative positions and more women around, do you feel like there's still an issue with sexism in the School of Science? I don't think uh, uh, it, it's a subtle thing. You know, I, I, I don't want to accuse people. Uh, it's, a, it's a subtle thing. I think uh, in some departments, it, you, you can't say that because in, in chemistry department, we have seven out of 28 uh, faculty members are, are women. We've been increasing it. Uh, and, uh, this woman had, and you know, it's it, it's hard to imagine there is overt sexism uh, in in this, uh, but there's always the chance that, and I think this is true, that men look at women's applications differently than they look at men's applications for a job, let's say, and. Women uh, graduate students or postdocs in science often seem different to certain men than men postdocs and graduate students seem to certain men in terms of their uh, uh, enthusiasm, in terms of their uh, uh, you know, willingness to work long hours and do what has to be done and so on, you know, this kind of baloney. Uh, 
you know, you can if they if they actually say anything, you can you can tell them what you think of it. But uh, you know, in all the meetings that we have to say should you know what's hire people, we always say you know how did the you know how does the woman the women candidates fare? What have we got and so on and uh, you know. In chemistry, over the last few years, we've just hired women. You know, we've hired men too, but we've hired women sort of one to one. In certain areas of science, it's harder to find the PhDs, women PhDs. It's not as hard as some people say, but it's harder. And in math, it's it it it's harder. And I have no idea, no real ideas about why that should be so, but in the life sciences, in biology, in chemistry, in neuroscience, in brain and cognitive sciences, there's no reason why we shouldn't have be going toward 50 percent men and women, except for the fact that it takes a long time to get there. Have you? Having seen the increase in women um, in your school, do you see any advantages from it? Do you see that has it has it changed the character of the school in any way? Uh, I think it's been very good for the men to see women who are excellent scientists and uh, often going home and taking care of families to see that you know they can do it and to uh, you know to uh, you can scratch your head and say I don't know how they do it you know how they do all the things that they do you know we have uh, people in biology women in biology who are you know have two small kids who you know take take care of things of course they have supportive husbands, perhaps. I'm, I'm, I, I'm guessing, but still, you know, you know that the reality is most of of life doesn't change so much, and so women have to get the burden of taking care of the kids mostly, and so on. And uh, we're seeing more uh, women with children, with real families, you know, and doing it all. I think that changes perceptions. Of, of people, you know, when, when that happens, it isn't the old macho guys, you know, working 80 hours a week that that are getting things done. It's also the women who are working only 60 hours a week and spending time with their kids. Um, do you think it's has it changed anything for the students? Well, th the students changed first. You know, it's 50 percent women. Or 45 percent women in, in the undergraduate program, and uh, in the school of science, the the number of women graduate students is about 40 percent, something like that. I mean, so the students have changed. You know, they don't see any issue here, and uh, and the and the fact that uh, most uh, you know that, that, that still the majority of the faculty are male uh, probably doesn't go unnoticed. But you know, I haven't. I haven't heard of any or, or um, elicited any comments about that. Um, you've won um, a lot of awards and honors, and I'm wondering um, have any of them meant anything in particular that were, were particularly special to you or meant more than the others? Well, of course, th I've won. Three teaching awards at MIT, and that to me were the best things. You know, I, I, I won the School of Science Teaching Award and the Baker Undergraduate Award and the uh, uh, Graduate uh, Graduate Award, and I guess I got a McVicker Fellowship. So, those are the things that I really are pr am proud of because uh, they signify what I try to do. Here at MIT, as much as possible, which is to, you know, improve teaching, improve learning, and you know, and do as good a job as I can. 
and uh, I mean the the stuff from research. You know, I'm not uh, a Nobel Prize winner, and uh, you know, I do good research. I'm, you know, member of the National Academy, but you know, uh, compared to having your students tell you that you you did a good job, not much. I thought it was very interesting that your physical chemistry book, it says on Amazon that it's been a leading book for 80 years. <laughs> yeah, well, me not think. mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, hmm, he's an older gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, talking a little bit about MIT in general, what do you think it is that makes MIT unique? Well, I'm not sure it's unique, but uh, I mean, it has to be unique in certain areas, but uh, I'm not sure it, it's unique. What makes it one of the best places in the United States and the best places in the world to be a student and to be a faculty member? And you have to say that the quality of the faculty and the quality of, of the students in collaborative work, in, in, in their intellect, in their willingness to interact uh, and in their broad range of interests has been, uh, for me, uh, you know, a wonderful thing that made my life uh, here uh, so great and so, uh, and made my career great. I mean, had I been a, a professor of chemistry at let's say the University of Wisconsin, it would have been a different life. It would have been a different group of people. It would have been a different uh, group of students. It would have been very, very different. And I, because the, the quality of students here on average and that distribution out at the far end is unbelievable. You don't get that just anywhere. Now, we have to make sure we don't lose that, right? Uh, I don't think we're in danger of losing it, but we have to make sure we don't lose that. And the quality of the faculty is is also just very high. And I'm not just talking about science faculty. I'm talking about humanities, arts, and social science faculty, and Sloan School faculty, and engineering faculty, and architecture faculty. I, you know, as you become dean, you get to know a lot of different people, and you sit on all these task forces and, and so on. You get to know a lot of people, and you get to know how smart people are about what they do, and and the concentration of smart people around here is just astonishing. What, you know, in uh, we we had a um, group meeting for dinner. I, I don't know how it started. Bob Jaffe in in physics and uh, Cynthia Wolf in literature decided to start a dinner meeting where a group of faculty would meet. Um, this is back in the 80s sometime. I don't remember when. Uh, we would meet for dinner, and we would somebody would give a talk about his or her research afterward. And uh, I, you know, I come to this meeting, and uh, you know, there's Vicki Weisskopf from physics, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, Herman House from electrical engineering and uh, uh, Cynthia Wolf from, from literature. And, uh, you know, it was just astonishing. I mean, these are, you know, great people, great men and women. And uh, uh, Giancarlo Rota from math and, uh, and Joel Moses from electrical engineering. And we would meet every week. We would have dinner. And then somebody would give a talk. And uh, I had to give a talk, you know. And, uh, you know, and people listened to me, and they actually interacted with me from all over. The, these were really uh, top flight, top flight people, and you know, it it was astonishing. You know, and it went on for about five years, and then I, you know, I dropped out so somebody else could could move in, and and so on. But it was absolutely great, and that kind of intellectual quality. Is rare that the concentration of intellectual quality is, is rare, and that's what I wanted when I came here, and that's what I found. Is that why you've stayed here so long? 
Well, I have a, I've had a good life. You know, I'm, uh, I've had offers to go uh, various places and, uh, and have seriously considered them, uh, uh, three or four, and I said hey, it wouldn't improve my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, of course, uh, my wife and I have been married now 48 years. It's, uh, our kids live in the Boston area, our grandchildren live in the Boston area now, so, uh, you know, there's no reason to leave, you know, and, uh, you know, we've had a good life. Do you, um, since you've been here for 44 years, um, do you have perspectives on how the institute has changed, how the students have changed, the faculty, administration? Well, the students, it's hard to tell whether I appreciate the students more or they've gotten better, but the students have certainly gotten, in my view, have, have remained very high level and have gotten better in, in my, as far as I can tell. Uh, you know, there there's sometimes a rash of cheating and things like that that goes on that really disappoints you, but for by and large, it's a minority of students that, you know, that are like that. And most of the students are just spectacular in my view. The faculty, I think, has improved. I think the, the School of Engineering has shifted in, in ways that are more compatible with the school of science, and I think I'm always uh, preaching to my engineering friends that science and engineering are, you know, collapsing toward one another, and that, you know we ought to get, we ought to do something about it. And the schools, the departments in the in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Science, which were actually Mostly service departments at one time have have come in their own, and they are you know often you know, just great departments. Economics, of course, is terrific. Political science is highly rated. Uh, linguistics is highly rated, and even uh, you know you have people in literature who are uh, top flight people and writers and uh, music and theater arts. You know, I mean, it's a really interesting place and and I didn't know it was an interesting place when I came in that way and uh, and maybe it wasn't I don't know you know maybe it was not as interesting maybe things have gotten a lot better or maybe I just have connected more well I think definitely the humanities and social sciences have changed mm -hmm. in the years that you've been here mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about that, what you just mentioned about engineering, the School of Engineering and Science sort of dovetailing uh, yeah. better? Well, it just is happening. The, uh, the, for a variety of reasons, um, the engineers, not all of them, but many of them, are doing more scientific work. Because if you're going to work with nanoparticles and nanosystems, you know that's science, and uh, and figuring out that came out of science, and then and and there's lots to learn, and lots to think about, and the engineers have picked it up, and the engineering departments are hiring scientists to be in engineering, because that's the direction that their research is is going. So the faculty is moving uh, closer to a in science and engineering to a unified. A set of unified interests. It's not completely true, of course. There are people who are interested in transportation systems. That's hardly science. But if you look in electrical engineering, if you look at mechanical, parts of mechanical engineering, if you look at chemical engineering, I mean, I don't think, I think the chemical engineers and the chemists are doing the same thing now, more or less, you know, and talking the same language, uh, which is, wasn't true 30 years ago. And so uh, I think people are, are coming together. Uh, and it's being driven by uh, things that are happening in science that the engineers are picking up and, and, uh, and, and taking over. And it's great, it's absolutely great. When Magnanti was dean of engineering and I was dean of science, I kept saying this to him, and uh, he 
didn't want any part of it because he wanted to. He also wanted to emphasize the large-scale projects of engineering. You know that are uh, also out there, and I was seeing only part of the story. He said, but you know, there's still there's no sharp boundary anymore, in my view. One of the things that interests me is the sort of concept of creating leaders, hmm? leadership training. And do you have any thoughts about that at MIT? Well, uh, as I told you, I, I was put into administrative positions by accident. Nobody said go to uh, go read a book or go even spend an hour talking to somebody else about what it's like uh, to do this and what the job is. And so at MIT, it seems to be you learn on the job. And, and I would say that uh, my experience has been that one year of being department head or one year of being dean, you go through the full cycle, you figure it out. Uh, you know, and, and if you're lucky, there wasn't uh, a terrible thing that happened that meant that you didn't learn that year. But uh, it's learning on the job. And I think it's very important at MIT uh, and uh, that the administrators are practicing scientists or engineers or social scientists or, hum or humanists, that it is not an, an administrative class that is doing this, but that uh, I, that's why I felt very strongly that I was going to step down as dean of science. Susan and Raphael asked me to stay on for a while, you know, to, to for the transition. But I was going to step down as dean of science and go back to my teaching and research. I gave up teaching for the dean of science. I didn't give up research, but uh, uh, I wanted to go back. And I think that's the proper mode of uh, a great university. People come into administration. They work at it for a while. They're probably smart enough to figure it out and to do a good job. And then they get out and go back and somebody else can come in. I don't think that the uh, professional administrator uh, is a good uh, position. I worry about it. You know. Do you worry about it just at MIT or in general? In general, I worry about it. Uh, but in, a, in an academic institution, the, what are we here for? We're here to teach, to educate, and to do research, which is another form of education. And you know, if you're spending your time making out budgets and thinking about the problems of you know of balancing the budget and so on, and you're not thinking about that those two important things that we do, then you lose contact with the you know the the central part of the of the university. You know, I think in a business, maybe the the job is to make money. So you know, there's more. There's, there's a different story here. This is what we do. You know, and and everything the administrators do should be with that in mind. That we are, you know, we are an educational institution. We're a research institution. You know, don't do anything that harms those two uh, essential things. It's an interesting thought to think that as an administrator of that sort of an institution, you get further away from the mission of the institute. Well, because you're doing something else. I mean, I did it for seven and a half years. I know that you, you think about other things. And it's hard. You have to go back and say, no, wait a minute. We're, the, what does this do to education? What does this do to the research mission? It almost seems counterintuitive that that would happen. Well, but you know, you, if you're if you're worrying about your budget, then you got to cut it, you know, or something like that. Then you got to think about wh what's the most important thing. How, how good a job do you think MIT does in terms of developing leadership abilities among students? It, that's hard to know. Students are young. I mean, we're talking about undergraduate students. Uh, students are young. Uh, you know, uh, we can probably do more. 
uh, I think we try, and there are a variety of programs that we try to do things. Uh, we could probably do more. Uh, but, you know, students come in with a broad range of ability to be uh, accepting of leadership. Uh, uh, there are, uh, you, you, get a, you do get a lot of students coming to MIT who have never been leaders in their group because they've been intellectually narrow, you know, and they've really concentrated on learning whatever they, they it is they learn and, you know, we do of course get some students who are very broadly educated in, in high school and, and are personally able to handle uh, interactions and so on. But we get a lot of students who are not so easy, easy to handle in uh, personal interactions. And you see it at MIT, you know, uh, m maybe more than at the University of Wisconsin, but less than at Caltech. You know? and, uh, and so we, we have a, we should have, you know, these uh, extracurricular uh, activities that help them do this. And a lot of the clubs and the fraternities and the FSL ILGs are grounds, places where the students learn how to be leaders, how to take care of their group, how to figure out what to do with their group. And that's why I'm a supporter of the FS ILGs and the student clubs because I think that's where students learn how to, how to, to do this as well as they can. Can we do more? I'm sure we can do more, uh, but I think it's got to be uh, uh, something that you offer, but you don't require. Yeah. What about your, your hopes for MIT for the future? Well, uh, I think we're in, we're in pretty good shape uh, these days. I think intellectually and uh, educationally, we, we're doing a very good job. Uh, I uh, I hope we don't screw up in any way. We, you know, it's always possible, but I don't. I doubt it. You know, we we are a very conservative organization. We don't rush into anything without really doing experiments, looking at the data, and thinking about it. So I I'm pretty sure we're not going to go. Uh, so, into anything bad. It might be nice if we were willing to take a flyer every once in a while, but uh, it's just not the ethos of the, of the institution. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that MIT is going to be fine for the next 20, 25 years. And, and uh, you know, maybe uh, all of us here can be proud of it.